What's up everyone, Professor Oak here. Welcome to episode one of Professor's Research. Now this is the first episode, so before we get too deep into it, I would like to start by saying thank you to the entire community for coming by my videos, coming by this video, coming by my Twitch stream, commenting, playing with me, interacting. It's been awesome and way more than I could have asked for or expected, uh, so deeply thank you. Uh, I'd also like to talk about the rules of this video. Rules, quote unquote. Uh, the things I'm looking for, rather. It, in each weapon, from each weapon class, are going to be a good moveset, decent range, and good damage. In that order, pretty much. Uh, there will be times when that order gets shifted if something has a ridiculous amount of damage off of something that just makes it obviously better than the other weapons, then maybe damage will be the most important thing. But for the most part, moveset, range, damage. Uh, the goal of these videos is to get everyone the same information that I have, which is which weapons work best on an intelligence build? Which weapons work best on a faith build? Why would you use the McKellen Knight Sword over the Coded Sword? Why would you use the Carrion Knight Sword instead of the Lazuli Glenstone Sword? All these questions, all these things that we may be asking ourselves. Should I dual wield this weapon? Should I use it with a shield? Is this weapon good as an offhand? All these questions are what I want to answer with this series. With that being said, today we are going to be talking about straight swords. I don't know if that was obvious from the straight swords I listed in my examples a second ago. Uh, I have all 10 characters made, I've tried these out on different builds, different levels, different setups, so I have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about, hopefully you'll indulge me, hopefully we'll all learn together, and if I miss anything or if there's any information that I don't have, please comment down below, let me know, I love information, I love to learn, that's why I'm the professor, so thank you guys very much, let's get into this. Okay, so first let's talk about the standard move set of straight swords. You've got this horizontal R1 that kind of just swipes and smacks. You've got the thrust R2, very, very good attack, followed up with a sweep that I don't honestly use much. Uh, the L1s when you're dual wielding, pretty cut and dry. You do an X, you undo the X, you thrust, and then you do a big swipe. That's nice. The first three, pretty quick and easy to hit a lot of them on characters that you're going to stagger, low, low poise opponents. Um, people not really, you know, paying attention to sleep at the will, that's just gonna eat their health bar away. Uh, let's see, two-handing the straight swords, you're gonna get that same sort of, well, it's a, a bit more vertical, really. Still just a slash, but a lot more vertical. R2, you're gonna have a horizontal sweep, followed up by a little more vertical horizontal sweep. And that's gonna be pretty much your moveset. You have the jumping attacks too, R1, swipe, R2 is a slam. Jumping L1 is that X that follows right into the combo chain. Very nice, I love it. Um, that's your standard moveset. We're going to be comparing the movesets of other weapons to that moveset pretty often. Like, for example, these first swords we're going to talk about. Now, there are 19 different straight swords in Elden Ring. If I were to go through each and every straight sword and talk about them at length, this video would be a, a year long. I'm going to briefly talk about a lot of weapons. The first one that I'm going to talk about only briefly is the Lazuli Glenstone Sword. It is nearly identical to the Carrion Knight Sword. When I say that, I mean that it has the same R1, the same R2, the same jumping attack, the same moves, everything from everything. The only difference in the moves are gonna be that Glenstone Pebble is the Ash of War for the Lazuli Glenstone Sword. Carrion Grandeur is the Ash of War for Carrion Knight Sword. So as far as moveset, we're checking off the list that these are the same barring the Ash of War. Range, the Lazuli Glenstone Sword is on the shorter side, whereas the Carrion Knight Sword is the third longest sword in the game, the straight sword in the game. Moving down to damage, the Lazuli Glenstone Sword has the lowest base damage of any straight sword in the game. They scale the exact same, so no matter what build you have, the Carrion Knight Sword will do more damage, the Carrion Knight Sword will be longer, and their moveset is the same. Glenstone Pebble is an incredibly strong Ash of War, but being tied to that Ash of War on this weapon that is shorter 
it's really that's its only use if you're gonna soft or hard swap to this weapon for glenstone pebble and at that point i would just have a broadsword it's gonna have higher damage infused magic or cold or what, whatever you do and put glenstone pebble on that i don't think this is a useful weapon so we're not going to talk about it very deeply we're going to move right into the carrion knight sword this has the same moveset so anything that you might want to hear about the lazuli glenstone sword you can pretty much take this and apply it to that the most unique thing about the moveset of the carrion knight swords is going to be the r2 block it is a chargeable block the animation here where i'm holding this above my head the entire time that you are standing like this if an attack hits you you will successfully block it as long as you have the stamina to not be guard broken the guard boost is only 33 so you're gonna really need to keep an eye on that stamina if you want to use this blocking i had some success with it in duels was able to get a counter attack uh, a lot of times i caught myself thinking would it not have been more advantageous if i knew the attack was coming to try to space it, strafe it, maneuver around it, maybe get a backstab or an L1. But it is useful. I'm not going to say it's garbage. You definitely can use it to success in duels. I just wonder if there might be better options. As far as the rest of the moveset goes, it's pretty much just your standard affair. Everything looks the exact same, except for the R2. Your R1, two-handed, still going to be the vertical slashes. And that's pretty much your carrying knight's sword. I would say that uh, it's a usable weapon. It all comes down to your build. So I guess here is the information. If you are on a pure intelligence build, you're better off going with a noble slender sword for range. You're obviously better off going with the broadsword for damage because it's going to be pretty much your highest base damage is going to be your highest damage no matter what scaling you do. The only exception that I found is that on a strength intelligence build specifically 60 strength 20 intelligence the carrion knight sword will out damage the broadsword by i think it was about seven damage so not a lot at all but the range is where you kind of go back to wanting the carrion knight sword rather than the broadsword so on a strength intelligence build these may be the most optimal but we'll revisit that at the end of the video when we do our wrap up So, Swords of St. Trina, how much do I need to say about these? If we're not going to use a bow or a crossbow, these are your only option to apply sleep inherently without the use of a grease or a drawstring grease. They apply sleep pretty decently. When you use the weapon art, which is similar to Poison Mist, Chilling Mist, or any of the mist type weapon arts, uh, they get extra sleep build up. You'll proc sleep faster. The downside to this is that if you were hit, the buff will go away. It takes about two to three hits of the L1 chain to proc a sleep. Once you've proc'd sleep, I think that my favorite go-to is like I have talked about or will talk about, stacking the charge attack axe talisman with the charge attack uh, tier and going for a nice R2. You could also jumping L1. I have experimented with trying to soft swap and hard swap while they're asleep. The uh, answer is you don't have enough time. You don't have enough time to fully charge an R2 either. And that is going to be the big drawback of these weapons. Possibly uh, one of only two drawbacks. Well, there's three if we want to be honest. The initial drawback is they're a lower damaging straight sword than most. With a powerful status and condition like sleep, I guess that's to be expected. But I still consider it a drawback. The second biggest drawback, honestly, is they're very short. They're among the shortest in the game. 
and that is very noticeable. They're actually the third shortest straight swords in the game, and a lot of hits that you would get with something like a uh, even a long sword or a noble thunder sword, it just they're gonna whiff on this, on these swords. Uh, the last drawback that I would like to say is just yeah, you don't really get the most damage off of actually proccing the sleep. There are ways to get more damage, but something like the Ripple Crest and Halberd or any weapon with the Sleep Grease put on it, you're probably going to find ways to get more damage out of that situation. With all that being said, I still consider these very viable. These are still on my list of weapons that I would use on specific builds. So next I'm going to talk about the Crystal Sword and the Rotten Crystal Sword, and I'm going to keep this very brief. These are very straightforward straight swords. Uh, their moveset is the typical straight sword moveset, thrusting R2, thrusting crouch attack, of course, the L1 chain is the same as every pair of straight swords is. Everything is exactly the same. The Ash of War that you are locked into on both the Crystal Sword and the Crystal, uh, the Rotten Crystal Sword is Spinning Slash. Now, the reason I want to keep this brief is these are also very identical weapons. The Crystal Sword has the fifth highest base damage in the game at 106. The uh, Rotten Crystal Swords only lose 4 base damage, their base damage is 102, and you get the application of Scarlet Rod as well. It's a very uh, powerful status condition, I know I just said that about sleep as well, but Scarlet Rod is pretty, um, I would almost call it cheese. Once you apply Scarlet Rod, you can turtle, play patient, that's always a great playstyle. In pretty much every competitive game that I've played, turtling and playing defensively wins games. And these are very turtle themed weapons. This wins games. Okay, moving on to Faith. Now I know that I skipped the Sword of Night and Flame while we were covering Intelligence. It's both an Intelligence and Faith scaling weapon. I'm going to point out there are a few weapons that I'm not going to speak on. I will quickly tell you that I think it is a gimmick weapon. It's uh, weapon art being square off, but one being Comet Azor and the other basically being like a version of Flame of the Red Mans. It's a gimmick. You're not going to hit Common Azor in a PvP match, not in a duel. You may hit it in an invasion, maybe if you catch someone off guard. And the version of Flame of the Red Mains, you can just put Flame of the Red Mains on a straight sword that you can hard swap to. It's, it's just not worth using. So moving on to one that is worth using, the McKellen Knight Sword. I had a lot of fun with this weapon. I used it probably uh, longer than some of the other straight swords that I was using. The Charged R2 is a unique forward progressing upward slash that is great for uh, basically chasing. You can get some good punishes with it, but charging the R2 kind of takes the time and without it being charged it only barely forward progresses. I was using it on a build where I stacked the Axe Talisman as well as the tier that enhances your charge attacks and was getting pretty nutty damage off of this. Another way that I used it was by uh, basically guard counters. Constantly going for guard counters. Not blocking a lot until the last moment, like especially how we would reaction roll. You would reaction block and then immediately go into a guard counter. And those hit so constantly. I'm sure it would with most straight swords. This is just kind of the build that I like started to figure out that specific tech. Guard counters or straight swords are awesome. Uh, the weapon art for the McKellen Knight Sword is Sacred Blade. Which I hit several times, it's not the most reliable, but it does buff the sword, which a somber weapon, scaling with faith, that you can buff, that's pretty nice. Uh, you could also have, as I do, uh, in your mixed physic, not only the charge attack, but the boost holy damage, getting pretty decent damage off this sword. This was also the first sword that I tried one-handed with a shield, and I believe this setup is pretty great. We'll talk more about the sword later, it's going to go kind of in our list with the uh, Trina, the Rotten Sword, and the Carrion Sword is very viable straight swords. Moving on. <laughs> Battle of the Pokes. Let's go. Okay, so he's got uh, Royal Knight Resolve Poke. Okay, that's something. 
Uh, rocks. Okay, so we got a base build of some kind, I suppose. Oh god, 640 damage on a rolling attack. Wow, very fun fight, man. Honestly, this thing is very strong. Moving on to our next opponent, we have... Son. Hello there. Hey. What kind of build do we have here? That's the Pest Glaive. I believe. Oh, another, a different kind of glaive. Okay. Two glaives, one build. Interesting. Okay. We've got the Coated Swords up next, these are another pair that I would really suggest to anyone on a faith build. Uh, Unblockable Blade, pretty slow and unreliable unless you can catch somebody in an animation. A uh, time that I've used these to great effect with their weapon art is against Great Shield users using Shield Crash and Shield Bash. Uh, at this point you should be pretty familiar with what the beginning of the Shield Bash and Crash animation looks like. What I'm doing is pretty much just sprinting a decent distance away far enough to where I know that the attack isn't going to make it to me before my attack hits them. And you're going to get a pretty big chunk of damage if you're specced into faith for these. They're awesome weapons, um, even if you're not fighting a great shield user. They do pretty decent damage. They're the second longest straight swords in the game. The only thing that's going to outrange them is the Noble Slender Sword. Uh, they've got a lot going for them. Their damage is pretty good. At only 55, I'm getting 419, which is not the highest, no. But, with my flask going up to 65, I think it jumps us to 520, a whole point. So, you can see that you're not going to get the highest damage returns, so I'd almost always use them dual wielded. But, at 80 faith, they are closer to that 500 range, that is a pretty standard uh, average for a optimal straight sword use. And, uh, I just love them, honestly. The noise is so satisfying. They, they do have the just typical attacks of a uh, straight sword nothing fancy except for the sound and the light and the unblockable attack but pure scaling off one stats always good especially if you're on a character that is a purely one stat character so these are gonna go on my list okay so the golden epitaph is gonna be the first straight sword that I'm gonna suggest as an offhand weapon and the reason being is that its weapon art is last rights it is a body buff which is pretty unique for a weapon to have a body buff. I know that Sacred Vow, or Golden Vow rather, exists as an Ash of War, but this being a somber weapon that gives us one, it's uh, at least unique. And a way that I've been using it is by left-handing it, giving myself the body buff, and just having it kind of as the offhand weapon for something slower, like this pickaxe that I like a lot, but doesn't have the speed to compete with a lot of uh, thrusting weapons that exist in Elden Ring. As you can see, the body buff is actually going to add like a flat 25, yeah 25 to this weapon, so it's nowhere near the best, you're better off with something like Golden Vow, but it does exist, it's not just completely useless, it's got the exact uh, straight sword moveset that we agreed at the beginning of the video is decent at least, so it's not awful, it's not going to get the best scaling or damage, it's not going to have the best range, it doesn't have a great Ash of War, it's uh, pretty much a painfully average straight sword. There you have it. Oh my. So, Regalia of Eocade, huh? This sword seems to whop. I absolutely love it. Uh, it does 
more damage than the broadsword infused occult on my dexterity arcane build it is pretty much the exact moveset i want out of a straight sword it has the typical moveset that we talked about at the beginning of this video it's ash of war has the potential to one shot uh, the downside being it's incredibly predictable, incredibly reactable, incredibly slow, and incredibly punishable. Therefore, I use it more as like a spacing tool to express my boundaries. So if someone likes to be in my face, this is getting through their heart, spinning a hundred times, and murdering them. If someone knows that, and I do this, then they're no longer going to be in my face, they're going to hang out at the mid-range. If you uh, imagine that I am the Sight of Grace and I am currently my opponent, or the side of grace is me and I'm currently my opponent rather they will tend to stay in this area so that they can be away from your regalia and come and punish you and when they stay in this area from you you have so much more breathing room so many more options that you can start hard swapping your weapon over to your broadsword or whatever you may keep as the other weapon and start throwing some bloody slashes maybe there's other things ice spear thunder bolt Switching to even like another weapon, getting your halberd out, something like that. Very fun, very good weapon. Uh, mentioned that it out damages the broadsword. It is also shorter than the broadsword, so it's not got the best range. But that is pretty much the only downside of this entire weapon. And with the Ash of War going as far as it does, and having just so much presence in a duel, I don't think the range is as big of a factor. So this is another weapon that I would highly su suggest. It's a great shoot. So the next weapon I'm going to talk about is the Ornamental Straight Sword. Uh, this is a very unique weapon in a couple different ways. The first way I'm going to talk about is the command to two-hand or one-hand this actually just pulls out another straight sword or sheathes that straight sword. So you have two weapons effectively off of one weapon with a 3.0 carry weight. Any weapon like this, like Star Scourge, Redown Swords, pretty good for uh, saving on endurance. Also unique to this is that while you have it only in one hand, if you have the weapon art for this buff, or the buff that is the weapon art rather, and you are one-handing it, and you R2, you're still going to get the two-handed R2s all the while maintaining the one-handed moveset, which in my opinion is a little superior to the two-handed moveset. Now when you go back to dual wielding these, the L1 is going to be block now, and the R1 is the L1 chain, so you're going to lose the one-handed uh, attacks that you get. Overall, I would call this a pretty decent uh, straight sword, very good to pair with Millicent's Prosthesis, and if you can afford it, Talisman slot wise, Rotten Wind Sword Insignia. This can one shot 50 vigor builds. Once they get up to 60, you're not going to be able to get that one shot anymore, but still very high damage in combo. Uh, you're stuck in it, can't roll out. The other person is going to have a chance to roll out after the uh, first flurry. There, and there. 
and you're going to be kind of a sitting duck stuck in that animation, so it's best to use it sparingly. Try to, uh, I guess, bait people into not expecting it and things, and using the shield is going to help with that. Uh, I actually stopped using Jellyfish Shield. The buff runs out quick, and switching away from it takes away the buff. And by switching away from it, I mean uh, not t not like pulling out your other weapon, but if you wanted to like get out of parry tool or something, then you would lose the buff. So I ended up just using it with a Brass Shield. It fits my fashion a lot better also, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I had a parry shield when I was using these, and was still able to get access to my R2s. And that was a fantastic, fantastic time. Highly suggest these weapons, ornamental street teams. Okay guys, we're starting to wrap it up here. Uh, at this little end part of the video, now that we've talked about each one, or at least discussed why we're not talking about each one, uh, I would like to kind of narrow this down, give you guys some words of wisdom to end on. So for me personally, I've kind of been making notes, writing a little list, keeping track of which swords we talk about are good. We talked about Trina and Crystal, Rotten Crystal rather, having a uh, status build up. We all know status buildup is very potent in this game, so those are good swords. We talked about the Coated Blade being able to deal with great shields. Good sword. We talked about the Regalia having a gimmick but a great one and a good moveset to go with it as well as high damage. Regalia is a great sword. We talked about the Carry and the Mikhail and the Ornamental Blade. Uh, just recently here we talked about the Noble Slender Sword, the Lord Sword and Sword, the Broad Sword. Uh, we talked about all these swords being good. But what's the best? What's optimal? How do we really figure out what we should be using? Well, the first thing that I would like to say is that I suggest the Lord Sworn Straight Sword. That is my number one best straight sword in the game. Now, people argue with me. You'll probably read comments that say otherwise and say Noble Slender Sword is the straight sword in the game, or best straight sword in the game. Now, the reason that I think people are saying that is because it has the longest range. Now, as far as non somber weapons, the Lord Sworn does have the second longest range of all non-somber weapons. That means it's the longest straight sword besides Noble Slender Sword that you can put an Ash of War on. It also has the moveset that I'm very fond of with straight swords, and it is the second highest damaging straight sword in total in the straight sword class. So that is why I'm picking it at number one. To talk about a little bit what setups I would run with it. So 
it's going to get your best scaling off of just strength or quality. It's going to get B on both in quality, and it's going to get a B alone as a strength weapon. There are some things like uh, cold, you can get C on strength and intelligence and dexterity, not so bad. Uh, blood, D on all. So the status infusions, it works really well with. This is kind of a jack of all trades type of sword. I have not found a uh, build that it does not work well on. I use dual Lord Sworn straight swords on almost, I would say, half my builds. And uh, yeah, it works well with every infusion. There's not a wrong way to go with this sword. If we're talking about a setup, whether you should run this one-handed, two-handed, dual-wielded, with a shield, with an S-Dock, again, this is just a, it meets any requirement you want. The optimal way that I've found to play with this is honestly, you want to pretty much always dual wield them with a shield in your back pocket. Uh, the L1 chain is just so good that the straight swords just love being dual wielded. The R1 is quick and is going to be a very powerful tool also, but you have access to it when dual wielding it, so there's no reason to not dual wield. The shield, I recommend and say is so important because the guard counter with the straight sword is infinitely better than any other guard counter in a game. I consistently can get the attack off in any match, you know, if I if I consider it to be the optimal play at the time, I'll go for it, and it almost always works. It's a great tool to have. So Lord Sworn specifically, as well as most straight swords, I'm gonna suggest dual wielding them with a shield. But there are also situations where I would say that you don't need to dual wield them. You could have something like an S dock in your hand. This is going to give you a bit more range, it's going to give you a thrusting attack which will make up for some weapons like the broadsword even though it has the highest damage. It won't have a thrusting attack and it'll have that shorter range. So something like an s can get you those hits when you're in the situations that a broadsword would, would not. Uh, for magic users, I'm sure that you know a seal would be an option. I personally didn't play like that outside of my faith character, which I mostly only run the seal for things like Catch Flame and Bestial Sling, so I didn't get the full experience. But as far as my testing goes, the most optimal way would be to pair it with something with a little more range, or to put a shield on it, to dual wield it. And I've also found a little success using Straight Sword as an offhand for something heavier and slow. Similar to the reason we would use offhand S-Dock, just kind of to uh, close gaps, fill in some uh, gaps with some active frames, or to rather bait your opponent into thinking a slower attack is coming, and then working with the offhand weapon instead. But we're getting a little off track of the uh, list here. Number one, I would suggest the Lord Sworn Straight Sword. That is the best straight sword in the game, in my opinion. Number two, we're moving to the Noble Slender Sword. I agree that it's one of the best. The damage trade-off for Lord Sworns is what makes me put it number two, and the reason I put it over the Broadswords is because of the moveset. Having this thrust, having the uh, poking uh, crouch attack, those are very, very important to me. I can't understate how important I think those attacks are to this weapon. Of course, most people are going to be L1-ing, jump L1-ing. In the setting of a duel against a lesser skilled opponent, L1s are going to win you the games, and you're not really going to have to even think about the R1 moveset. But against someone who's a little more on their toes, might know the moveset a little better, knows your playstyle a little better, peppering in these R2s and these charged R2s, not the follow-up, but the charged regular R2, and these crouching R1s are going to give you so many hits that are going to add up to so much more damage. It's just, you know that playing against someone that can reaction roll, uh, you're not going to be able to hit them as easy. And just having this versatile moveset, it's going to help you so much. So, we have number one, Lord Sworn. Number two, Noble Slender Sword. Number three, I have to give the Broadsword. Purely for being the optimally dam damaging, highest damaging sword on so many different builds. Uh, I would say that even if you're running one of the somber weapons, have a Broadsword as your left hand weapon. That way you're still going to have your range on your R1s, but your L1s will be doing that much more damage. Uh, th that fact alone, that the broadsword is easy to just tack on to any other build to make your damage a little higher, and you're still going to get this moveset, you're still going to get whatever your left hand weapon art is, and you can put a weapon, or an Ash of War, rather, on the broadsword 
for some, you know, hard swap shenanigans or whatever you want to do, uh, that makes Broadsword number three for me. So all three of my top three are going to be non-somber weapons, but the next two I am going to dedicate to somber weapons. Number four, I have Saint Trina. The Sword of Saint Trina is really, I don't think I really even need to explain myself too much on why I put that so high. Status buildup in this game is ridiculous. Sleep is a very strong one. Being able to put someone to sleep without actually making contact with them and then get free damage, it's a very strong tool. And with something like the Swords of St. Trina, you do not have to overcommit because you know as long as you get the sleep proc, you're going to get a chunk of damage. So being aggressive with the straight swords is a often suggested playstyle. But with the Swords of St. Trina, you can kind of play half and half. You can aggress until you need to back away. And, of course, their sleep is going to go down. But it's just always something present in their mind. You, you have a lot of control of the pace of the matchup. So that's Sword of St. Trina at number four. One, Lord Sorn. Two, Noble Slender. Three, Broadsword. Four, St. Trina. The fifth is the Coded Sword. And the reason that I'm putting Coded Sword at number five is the pure holy damage. Uh, pure damage... Uh, of any type is preferred to split damage, but a pure elemental damage is especially good in a game where shield poking, uh, great shields, uh, things like that seem to be pretty prevalent. I really, really enjoyed using the coded swords. They're also the second longest straight swords in the game, which very much helps, and that's second longest in total, not just of the somber or non-somber weapons. They are the second longest straight sword behind Noble Slender Sword. Uh, their damage is average, but paired, they do respectable damage. I mostly rate them as high as I do because of the meta of this game. As many people running around with uh, great shields, shield poking, which is totally necessary, and I understand because of things like uh, ultra great sword poke, uh, you know, rapiers and things like that that you really need to block. I understand why people are holding shields so often, but you need something to counter that, and the coated blade seems to be a very good option for countering shields. Uh, I have...
moving on. That is pretty much all I have for you guys. I hope you've learned something. I hope maybe I've said something you didn't know before. Or maybe at least inspired you to try out some new things. Uh, thank you guys all for watching. If you've watched this long, you're amazing. If you've skipped around and just found parts you wanted to watch, then you're amazing too. Uh, thanks to everybody. This is something that's been a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. I see people like Chase the Bro, Stulovsky, uh, G9, posting daily so much footage, and I just assume something like this may be something I could just throw together. It wasn't at all. I've gained a new respect for YouTubers in general. Uh, it was very difficult. Getting the footage that I wanted was very difficult. Finding the programs that would allow me to edit these things, very difficult and expensive. This was something that was uh, maybe ambitious on my part, and I'll admit that. Uh, whether I keep going, keep trying, pretty much down to the support of the people, I would love to. I would love to keep doing this, but I have this feeling that what I'm doing might not be as useful to you guys as it is uh, making me happy. So I don't want to annoy people. I don't want to be just another face in the YouTube void that people are like, oh, okay, this guy, he is trying something he shouldn't be. But that's just insecurity talking. I think we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome. I know I do. You know, Professor Oak, my profile picture, that's Imposter Oak there. Little, uh, lore for you. Uh, I feel Imposter Syndrome constantly. So this is something that is kind of a therapy for that. And I thank you guys for indulging that therapy. I hope to hear from all of you. Tell me how much this sucked or how great it was. Tell me I'm being emo on the internet. Either way, love you all. Thank you, the FromSoft community. That's what I have. Later.